Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the periodic table and think about the trends that are involved. Basically, you can look at a periodic table and see a whole bunch of patterns, and that's what we're going to look at today. Um, ever so quickly, I'm just going to run through these. We know that all of our alkali metals, we've got some information about them. They're very reactive. This is the type of stuff that we're going to see, that they're very reactive and some other things. You can read through this at some point if you'd like. But um, we see that all of the alkali metals we know have a plus one, they have one valence electron, let's say that. All of our alkaline earth metals have two valence electrons. Then we go over to our halogens, and how many valence electrons? Seven. Seven. And then um, noble gases are eight. And if we think back to electron configuration and valence electrons, what we want to think about is all the group one have those one valence electrons, two has two valence electrons. Um, then we looked at our transition metals, and we think about those properties. They're a little bit different, but at this point, what did we say about our valence electrons? It's going to be two electrons at this point. So now we get into periodic trends, and again, what we're saying is that we can see a lot of information if we just look at that periodic table. It, it tells us a lot of uh, trends that we see. So we're going to start with a bunch of definitions. Get out your pens. Lots of writing to do. So our core electrons, those are going to be the electrons that are not valence electrons. So in other words, the electrons in lower energy levels. All except valence electrons. Yeah, this is a big, heavy note day. Okay, and so by valence electrons, we're talking about the electrons in the outer most energy level. If they're out there at the, the ends of that electron, or that atom, then they're going to be the ones that are playing a role in bonding. So play a role in bonding, because they can easily be knocked off or they can easily attract, help to, um, that's going to be where others are attracted to and they enter those valence shells. If we talk about isoelectronic, remember iso means same electron configuration. So same electron configuration. So for example, we said sodium with a plus one ion charge to it and neon, both of those have an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, so both of those would be considered isoelectronic. So those are some definitions that you probably already know, but just to remind you of what we're going to be looking at here. Now we get into oxidation numbers. And um, for oxidation numbers, really what we mean here is that it's just the charge that is formed. Whatever that charge is, that's considered the oxidation number. And for a stable configuration, remember the octet rule, what needs to be filled? What sublevels? Which, which sublevels are we are going to be the valence electrons? S and P's are going to be your out your valence electrons. So for a stable configuration, we're going to say that the outer most S and P sublevels are filled. Really, this is just following that octet rule. That is when an element or an atom is going to be most stable. So now we can go through and look at some examples. And let's start with something like sodium. And this, we're going to go ahead and we're going to write some electron configuration down. So you're looking at a periodic table. For just plain sodium, we know it's going to be 1s2, 2s2. Keep going. What would it be after that? 2p6, 3s1. So when we see this and we think about making a stable configuration, What's the most likely thing that sodium is going to do? It loses the S. So here, we have this extra S. So if it loses this one S electron, 
then it's still got a full outer shell. It's got those eight electrons in the second energy level, which happens to be the highest energy level at that point. So by losing one, if it loses one electron, then it's going to form, um, so I guess I'll write, forms Na plus one, which we know is going to be isoelectronic with, and in this case it's going to be neon. Okay, so we can keep going. And with magnesium for our electron configuration, everybody sees that it's number 12. So we're going to have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s2. So what's going to be easier, to lose 2 or to try and gain 6? Losing 2 is going to be a lot easier. So lose 2 electrons. And in the process, it's going to form what ion? Um, it will be isoelectron with a plus 2 charge. And then isoelectronic, again, that's going to be with neon. And we are going to do this for the um, following ones, and I think it's magically going to appear for you guys at home. Okay, so these have magically appeared for you. We're on the last one. We're looking at chlorine, and we just wrote down our electron configuration. We see that there are seven valence electrons, and the easiest thing to do, instead of trying to find some atoms to take those seven electrons, it would be much easier to gain how many? One, one electron. So gain one electron started off neutral, so now if it gained a negative particle, it has a negative one charge, so it becomes the chloride ion. And as we went through this, and this, this is not a big deal right now, but what we end up seeing is that these guys that form the pluses, that's just the sodium ion, the magnesium ion, the aluminum ion. But when we form the negatives, we change that ending, and I'm going to talk more about this when we get into nomenclature, but it becomes the phosphide ion, sulfide chloride ion. And we see that the chloride ion becomes isoelectronic with argon yet again. So we've also looked at some terminology. Um, it was this past unit, but we're going to look at it again. All of these guys form positive ions. I think we've already said this, but if it's a positive ion, what's the name of that ion? Do you remember? Did we say that? Maybe we didn't. This might be the first time you're hearing it. It is a cat ion. And we can remember that because that T, how handy, it looks like a plus sign. So there's a cat ion is what it forms. If it's not a cat ion, maybe you even know this term, you, you might have heard it before, it is an anion, and I'm going to underline N for negative, which looks like a negative sign. So you need to remember that those are the types of ions that are formed. Positive ions are cations, negative ions are anions. And I think we're good here. Okay, so now we have our main group elements, which again, when we talk about main groups, let me just, I can erase this. These guys are your main group elements. Those are the guys that are in the S and P blocks. And the main group elements, uh, the charge can be predicted by the valence electrons. That's what we thought about. We looked at that electron configuration and thought about our number of valence electrons. But the question is, what about transition metals? So what about transition? metals. Um, they're called transition metals because they do not form uh, one set charge. It can change. So they've got more than one. At this point we've really said, hey, they're a plus two because they've got that S2 filled. But it can change. So if we were to look at an example of something like iron, and we think about our electron configuration for iron, and we're going to do a shortcut. We're going to say that it's argon, and then after argon is our 4s2, and then a 3d, and you count over, and it's 6. So 
let's think about what our possibilities could be. It could either lose two electrons right here, right? That makes sense to us. That's what we've been talking about at this point. So let's write that down. If lose uh, two electrons, all valence electrons are gone. So that sounds like a good possibility. If that were the case, then we would see that it would form the ion Fe with what charge? Plus two. That is one possibility. But tell me what else you know about something like this in our D block. What do we know about the D block instability and when might it be more stable? It's half full. So we see a D6. That doesn't sound 6 out of 10 isn't half or fully filled. So what might it do here? Okay, so get rid of one more. And in that case, it could lose if lose three electrons. And again, maybe you need to make a note to yourself, but it would lose these in order to get the half filled is what we're looking at. So if lose three electrons, um, it would form, let's say form a D5 because half filled more stable. And in that case, we would see it's lost three electrons, so it would be that Fe plus three. Okay, so I'm going to pause it, and we're going to think about why uh, copper might form a plus one charge. Okay, so what we ended up seeing is that copper is an exception. That's why it forms that plus one charge, because it has, instead of being a 2,9, it's a 1,10, and losing that is, um, w would give it a plus one charge. Yes, it can also do the 2,9, and that's why it can also be a plus two charge, is what we end up seeing as well. Okay, so now these are the factors that affect periodic trends, and there are four of them that you should know. There's, they're all listed down at the bottom. Distance from the nucleus, so as the energy levels increase, the electrons are further away from the nucleus, so that's going to be something that affects how things react. And then we have effective nuclear charge, which I'll talk about, shielding effect, and electron repulsion. So the first one is distance from the nucleus. This is pretty straightforward. As you move away from the nucleus, the electrons, the valence electrons, are further and further away from the nucleus. So if you think about the fact that there's a positive charge in that nucleus, but when you've got electrons way out here that have their negative charges, they're not going to feel that attraction, that pull quite as much. So when we start talking about which electrons are easier to knock off, that sort of thing, you can look at this and probably think about which ones would easily be lost and which ones are feeling the pull from that nucleus a little bit stronger. So that's one thing that's going to affect trends. The next one is effective nuclear charge. This is a tougher one. This is not very intuitive for people. So um, what we look at here, it's the difference between the number of protons and electrons. So as you move across a period, so we're talking about moving to the right, as you move across the period, you see that not only, actually, um, it says as you increase the protons, the electrons are held tighter. So the way I like to think about this is not only do we have additional, here's three protons, for example. Each time you're adding a proton, but you're also adding an electron. Protons are big and massive. Electrons are tiny little specks of something. Remember, it's like 1 1836 of the, the mass. So if you think about this as being a magnet, and the electron is just being a tiny little paper clip. Well, by the time you get over here to neon, you've got all of these, I'm not counting, but you've got all of these big massive protons in there. And you've got, you keep adding in the electron as you move to the right, but they're tiny little paper clips. So what they do is they more effectively pull in that one ring of electrons. So they pull them in tighter is what we see. It's the difference between number of protons and electrons. As, um, 
as the protons increase, the electrons are pulled in tighter, is what we end up seeing. And I'll kind of go over that again some more. So this is our example about magnets. Um, if you were to think about within the same period, we've got lithium at one end and fluorine at the other end almost. And you've got, if you have this one magnet here with lithium, but you've got just one electron here as a valence electron, it's going to be pr pretty far out. But if you have the same number of energy levels, but instead you've got a whole bunch of electrons in there, and you have a whole bunch of big, huge, massive magnets that are able to more effectively pull that ring of electrons in tighter is what's going on. So that's why they, um, that occurs. Okay, next one. Uh, skip one. Shielding effect basically just says that if you have core electrons, they're going to shield the effect that the, um, the attraction between your nucleus and your valence, if there's a bunch of core electrons, they're going to shield the valence electrons from that nuclear pool. And then finally, the electron repulsion, negatives and negatives, they don't like each other, so if you get a whole bunch of them in the same energy level, they're going to want some elbow room and they're going to try and spread out. Okay, so we're going to use those four ideas when looking at some different trends that we see. And um, the first one we're going to look at is atomic size. We're going to think about it first within a group. So in other words, as you move down a vertical column. So as move down. And this one is pretty intuitive. Um, basically, we see that, yeah, the distance from the nucleus is going to have a big effect on this. As you move down, you're moving further and further and further away from the nucleus. So what would you expect to happen to the size of that atom? It would get bigger. So as you move down, my arrows are going to show increasing. Um, as you move down, we would expect the size to get bigger. So what we, we could say here is increase energy levels, therefore size increases. So yeah, that has a pretty big effect on it. Um, the other thing that happens is shielding effect. So the core electrons are not, you've got all of those core electrons between the nucleus and the valence electrons, so those are going to shield the valence electrons from that nuclear pool. So let's just say core electrons shield valence electrons from nuclear pool. And um, really that's, those are the big things that we end up seeing. That's going to be within a group. That's why it gets bigger as it moves down. But now if we look at the other way, if we look at it within a period, so we've already said this is the trend. Now we want to think about how things work across a period. And the distance from the nucleus, well, that's not going to be a factor because it's always going to be the same energy level, same energy level. So that's not a factor. What we're going to end up seeing is this one that we talked about, the effect of nuclear charge. Um, in fact, we could go down and say shielding effect. It's the same number of core electrons. Um, those things aren't that important. But with effective nuclear charge, and the way we phrase nuclear charge, do I have this written somewhere? Yeah, okay, you did see this abbreviation, good. So the way we are going to um, think about this is that the higher the effective nuclear charge, and maybe we even want to make ourselves a note somewhere that this is really separate from size, but maybe you want to make yourself a note that effective nuclear charge increases in that direction. So as you move to the right, what we end up seeing is that there's a stronger nuclear pool. Stronger nuclear pull. And therefore, if you've got that nucleus turn pulling harder on it, what's going to happen to the size of the atom? It's going to get smaller. So therefore, smaller atom. 
which means, and again, this is the one that's not so intuitive, that means that it actually increases in size as you move to the left. So that's what we really need to see on this one. I can't remember. Let me see if I've got it here. Yeah, so you can see a little um, visual of that, how, of course, it increases in size as you move down the period because you're increasing energy levels, but it actually gets this bigger this direction because the pool is not as great on the nucleus as when you move to the left or to the right. Okay, so now we are going to... Um, we are going to look at some calculations of effective nuclear charge for a couple things. And the first one is beryllium. So with beryllium, and I guess we have to kind of write small here. With beryllium, we see that effective nuclear charge is just going to be when you have... Um, we had already mentioned that it's going to be the number of... Actually, maybe we didn't mention this. Sorry. We should maybe put this wherever it would be helpful for you guys. You've got this somewhere. But it's going to be maybe on the front side you just want to remind yourself or write this down that the effective nuclear charge is going to be equal to your atomic number, that's where Z comes in, minus your core electrons, which this is kind of silly in some respects because you already know this is something else. What's, what is, it's going to be effective nuclear charge equals core electrons, or atomic number minus core electrons. And so for this first one that we're going to look at, which is beryllium, beryllium has an atomic number of four, and as far as the um, core electrons, how many are, all, are wrapped up in the core? How many of those four? How many? Two of them. So it equals two. Let's do a few of these and then we'll get a, we'll see the pattern that takes place. Carbon, what we end up seeing is that it's got an atomic number of six. You subtract those two core electrons and you get four. For nitrogen, it's going to be seven. You subtract those two core electrons and it equals five. For fluorine, atomic number of nine. You subtract those two core electrons and it equals seven. So really, your effective nuclear charge is the same thing as what? Number of valence, number of valence electrons. That's what we end up seeing. Your number of valence electrons is, increases as you move to the right because and your number your effective nuclear charge increases as you move to the right. So this is the big pattern that we are seeing. And now if we were to look at this for um, titanium and vanadium, and I don't have a lot of space, so I'm going to move mine up here, but you guys have more room. So for titanium, we notice that titanium has an electron configuration for us to 3D2. So that's what the electron configuration looks like. If we were to subtract the number of core electrons. So it's got, an, it's got an atomic number of 22. If you subtract the core electrons, how many of those are core? How many? 20. So if we subtract 20 of them, we see that there is two. If we went through the same thing for vanadium, it would be 3D3. Again, when you go through that math, you get 23 minus 21 are core electrons in this case. So for that, again, it's going to be 2. So what I want you to see from this is that in D block, in other words, your transition metals, the size is constant across period. And then we see that again, we see that here, except I guess it's not, we don't see our transition metals, but they would be um, constant across. Okay, we're moving on. Um, now we want to get into, we just looked at our atomic size. The tougher one actually is for the size of ions. 
So if we were to think about, first of all, let's think about these individual trends. We've got our stair step line right here. We've got metals and we've got non-metals. The trends on these are going to be exactly the same for exactly the same reasons because we're still talking about size. It's just of an ion. But we have to think about it independently. So the size of metals increase like that. The size of nonmetals also increase in that direction, that same direction. But it is independent of one another. So first of all, what this means is if I were to compare something like the sodium plus one ion to the aluminum plus three ion, look at your red arrows, which one of those, they're in the same period, which one of those would be bigger? Sodium. Good. So if you were to compare the nitride minus three to the fluoride minus one, again, it trends to the left being bigger, so the nitride minus three would be bigger than the fluoride minus one. So that's the first thing we see. Now if we want to, comp and what we just did, we compared cations to cations and anions to anions. So we could write all of this information down. You could write down, as you move down, increase in size due to energy level. So let's just say increase due to energy level, and that's going to be, um, really for both of these guys, increase due to energy level. And then as you move to the right, remember it gets smaller due to effective nuclear charge. So let's just say it's going to increase this direction because it's got a smaller effective nuclear charge. And it's the same for both of these. Okay. Now we get to the tougher part where we're going to compare anions to cat, uh, cations to anions. Actually, this is, it's going to be when we get to the neutral that it gets a little bit tougher. So when we're comparing one to the other, we always see that within the same period, the cations are going to be smaller. And if you think about why that is, think about what's going on. I'm trying to remember. We could go all the way back to our very beginning when we had our notes where we saw that in the same period, if you had something like aluminum and phosphorus, Aluminum ion is isoelectronic with neon. The phosphide ion was isoelectronic with argon. So which one would you expect to be bigger? And maybe we just need to zip back there real quickly. I'll do it real quickly. Um, if we go back to, right here, we saw these guys are in the same period, but here we have aluminum being isoelectronic with neon, and the phosphide ion is isoelectronic with argon. So we would expect, within that same period, you would always expect to have, I don't know where we're at, I went too far. Okay, you would expect to have the um, anions be larger than the cations. So within same period, cations smaller than anions due to lost energy level. So another way, if you want to write yourself a different note, you could say the non-metal ions bigger than metal ions. Okay, big day of notes. I know this is um, going on and on. We have last little bit to go to, and that is to compare. Um, actually, this is just showing you the, the sizes. Okay, last little bit is comparing the ions to the neutral atoms, the neutral parent atoms. So if you were to look at something like calcium and the calcium plus two ion, 
if you had calcium, that's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and 4s2. But when it forms that calcium plus 2, we see that it loses an energy level. So um, if we were to compare these guys, which one, this is just the blue is the calcium, and the green is the calcium plus 2. So out of these guys, which one's bigger? Calcium is going to be bigger. So cations, we see, are smaller than the neutral atoms. And the reason being, they have, have one less energy level. It lost an entire energy level. And if we were to do the same sort of thing with an anion, and we went through and we said for fluorine, fluorine is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Well, if we wanted to make a fluoride ion, this becomes a 2p6. So that's for fluoride ion. The blue is just fluorine. So in this case, the anions are what? They're going to be bigger. And the reason being, they're not adding an energy level. All they're doing is adding an extra electron. And those electrons, they want to spread out. They want some elbow room. So it's going to be because of electron repulsion. Electron repulsion causes spreading out. Okay, last few things we've got here. We are doing well. Okay, so we will go to, um, this is just showing some comparisons. And now we just want to compare our sizes of uh, magnesium plus 2 and oxide minus 2. And if you notice, they're not in the same period. They're in different periods. So if we saw magnesium with a plus 2 is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Well, oxide is going to be that same thing. It's going to have that same electron configuration. And it's basically the same as what neon has, right? So now if you think about the number of protons, this is 12 protons, 8, 10. Well, in, in this case, you've got the same number of electrons in every single case, but you've got more protons in the magnesium ion than you do in the oxide ion. So those additional protons, those magnets, are going to pull those electrons in much tighter. So we're going to say same number electrons, therefore greater pull, I'm sorry, greater, greater number of protons pulls electrons it, and tighter. Okay, so there we go. Um, same number of electrons, but the greater number of protons pulls electrons in tighter. So what you end up seeing here, if you were to try and rank these in order, you would see that your magnesium is going to have the most protons, so it's going to be the smallest. It's pulled in the tightest, your magnesium ion. Your oxide is the opposite end of the spectrum. The neon is going to be in the middle. So the, this is going to have, um, this is to do with size, if we're talking about size. And again, that's because it's got the most protons here and the least protons here. Okay, one last one. Here we're looking at sizes of potassium oxide and iodide ions. So if we went through that same kind of process, we would see that for potassium, you've got neon, and I know I'm going through this quickly, but neon, which is that for our electron configuration. And then for your oxide, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then finally for your iodide, it's krypton. And then 5s2, 4d10, and 5p6. So what that means is that if we thought about um, our number of energy levels, there's a couple different things we can think of here. But you can look at where 
oxide is compared to potassium, they um, really it's just our energy levels. Oxide's going to have the fewest energy levels, then potassium, and then your iodide. So you could really just see that pretty clearly from something like this, if you looked at that. And again, that's going to be because of fewest energy levels, and it's most over on the iodide side. We are done.